Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be presenting and discussing on this topic. My name is Aron from Mexico. Sarah from the US. And Daniela from El Salvador. Thank you to the EPA consortium for um, helping with the administration and giving us the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Tornheim, for taking the time to come and present um, on your paper and your, your research. Um, we, it's a very dense topic because it's not only about destabilization, it's about social technical systems and that's, that goes deep, it goes very deep. So um, to start off, we're gonna cover some, or yeah, the structure. Uh, we're gonna review some of the concepts um, and then uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we're gonna go through three observations. Each one gets one, fair and square. And then uh, we're gonna lead into the discussion. Um, I maybe I'll move over here so you can see, but uh, yeah, or my notes. Um, the socio-technical system. Firstly, you showed this graph as well. Um, we can see the three dimensions: uh, the techno-economic components and flows. So you have the technical materials and economic aspects to it. Um, this includes um, kind of the, the the things, infrastructure, and everything. You have actors and social groups um that are interacting um uh with one another um and the social technical system is the outcome of how um their activities as incumbent and mainstream actors are interrelated to one another and they're receiving these rules and institutions and um they're uh, acting on them and you can describe this as a field um, of, of the actors that are participating in interrelatedly, taking one another into account. Um, next slide, please. This uh, wasn't mentioned, the multi-level perspective, but we're gonna be referring to it quite a bit, so I thought that it would be interesting. Um, it's referenced in your book with uh, Gilles from 2022 and also in the tramway paper. But um, most important thing, you have the socio-technical system here in the middle, where things are happening, so to say. And then you have the landscape at the very top, which uh, is exogenous, so actors can only adapt to it. And to this, you would uh, it's slow changing states and developments. So typical examples are demographics, geopolitics, macroeconomic trends, shocks like wars and crisis, but you're reacting to it. You can't adapt, you can't change it in the short term. Um, wait, and then you have niches as well. The multi-level perspective originally was very focused on how niche innovations can break through into the system in order to have a transition. So in fossil fuel, how can we get actual niche innovations from renewable energies when it was very underdeveloped or very underfinanced? How can it break through and, and kind of become in, come into the mainstream, so to say? Um, However, there's a different stance on this or a different focus um, in the papers that we're evaluating. It's a lot more about the socio-technical system. It's not as much about how these niche innovations are gonna be promoted. It's about what you can do in the system since we're talking about destabilization. Um, and Sarah's gonna talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so basically to summarize some of your findings apart from what you've already summarized we looked at your contributions to the literature um specifically um your framework proposed focusing on existing socio-technical systems and their destabilization as opposed to the more traditional body of literature the larger one about the emergence of novelty um and we also go over two of your typologies of destabilization governance archetypes so the first one would be um, governance interventions and we'll go a little bit more in depth on that later but basically um, you propose four different types and also um, three different motives for destabilization governance um, and then we also looked at four different characteristics of destabilization that you've already gone over a little bit but we'll just recap real quick um, one it's a challenge to stability it has to be a challenge to already locked in structural patterns two um, the there are multiple uncertain sources of change that evolve with time so it's a complexity topic it's not something that can be easily summarized um, three um, incumbents are the main focal actors in processes of destabilization um, there's power and resource asymmetries that reinforce stability and um, the other actors although they aren't the main components of destabilization are those that are challenging these incumbent actors or other vulnerable groups that are affected by them and then fourthly um, destabilization is a non-linear process made of pa patterns and mechanisms 
um, and especially is important in path determinism and causal pathways, and that um, the difference between sudden crises and continuous stresses must be examined when you're talking about destabilization. Um, so we're gonna go a little deeper in on incumbent actors in power. Um, in your literature, we found that um, there's a reductive view of incumbency where you can see it maybe as multinational corporations or the common idea of just like powerful actors, but actually there's a very diverse number of different incumbent actors potentially. Um, in cover a, a range of various interests and strategic positions that both change over time and intersect with different regimes. So there's no rigid attributes or actors, and you can't overly simplify what incumbent actors do or what they are. So one framework that we propose to look at it um, more deeply, especially without neglecting human and community perspectives, you've definitely heard of this, but it's a framework by Sterling called um, Worm Eye versus Eagle Eye. So um, it's a little complicated, it's very dense, the literature. However, we wanted to bring it up because we wanted to analyze how you can look at community perspectives. An eagle eye view um, is what he calls a closed topology, um, confined, monocongruent, discrete, and singular, where you can clearly kind of see definitions between different regimes and their intersections. And um, the new trajectory is kind of manifest um, it's overlapping with many different ideas and regimes and actors. They're all pointing to the same place. You can put it a central direction. If you mapped it on a map, you could go to the middle. If we look at worm eye, we think of it as bottom up. As you can see, it's more complex. Basically the idea, you don't need to know all these different little words, but basically the idea is that the patterns are much more complex, the relationships are more complex than you can put down in a chart. So simply, um, it's an open topology with, within deep incumbency, not obvious actors that you can see um, with overt power relations, but actually tacit manipulations and things that you might not immediately see, um, with pervasive, polygrant, and entangled and plural um, within the socio-material milieu. So that being said, a more simplified view of eagle eye versus worm eye and something that hopefully we can all understand. Incumbencies in eagle eye are understood in neatly scaled levels. You can talk about a regime, a sector, and a system and um, dilute it. And then in the worm eye view, incumbencies are irreducible terms that um, refer to entire societies. So you can't talk about one regime and pluck it out of a society. You must be within the context. Um, eagle eye is a process of scrutiny that aligns with deep incumbencies, supporting existing relations, um, especially in the role of knowledge. Um, in order to simplify the production of knowledge, you are going to reassert existing incumbencies without acknowledging them. In the worm eye view, um, you resist by illuminating complexity and acknowledging how complex it is, and knowledge production is tied to incumbent privilege, so anything that we write, you must acknowledge why you're working within the system that already exists. And then eagle eye interventions might be policy instruments that are constructed top down, while where my interventions um, would support democratic collective action struggles. Not now, please. Not now. Yeah, that's good though. Oh no. Nightmare. <laughs> okay. And so while we're not going to teach you the worm eye versus eagle eye debate, this inspired some comments on the tram systems framework. I have nothing more to say about this tram. <laughs> it's this is a French tram, an ancient French tram. <laughs> not sure. Double decker. <laughs> <laughs> this is what people were not liking at the time, or so we say. Yay. Okay. So um, as we just saw within the presentation, um, th the destabilization of trains was a self-fulfilling prophecy due to substitution by motor vessels. Um, because we had an alternative, we were able to f phase out. Um, and the two reasons maybe that um, it was so easy to phase out were the original chaotic implementation um, due to the structure of how the trams were organized publicly and privately and the aesthetics. However, um, I looked a little bit more into the literature because your first idea is like what power relations are like motivating this real phase out. And we found that um, some opposition that was said to be public opinion 
um, and aesthetic conservatism as if you didn't want to ruin the streets with these ugly trams. It was actually, um, some of it in Paris especially was concealed industrial motivations to re reject the influence of companies with American origins. And in another one, um, Schmucky found that newspapers, and uh, looked through many newspapers, but it was in the UK and Germany, but in general, um, opposition to trams aesthetically um, was partially class motivated and also partially politically motivated as opposed to genuine citizen outcry. Um, and so this is just a quote, I'll give a second to read, I won't read it all out, but the critical voices um, might have been proxies for political and economic debates as opposed to um, genuine public opinion. Okay. Okay, now regarding the second observation that we can make in the topic, and this is uh, in the aspect of governance. While defining the aspect of governance, Professor Turhim makes like a differentiation among two different types that we can find. One is the deliberate, and the, as Sarah mentioned before, we can find four uh, types or topics, in this case, direct, indirect, experimental, and civic. Uh, due to time constraint, we are not going to go over each of them. We are just going to say that basically they relate to the way that you can kind of increase, trigger, or even slow down the stabilization process. And another definition that we can find is the untended governance. And in this case, it's when there is not an explicit intention to kind of trigger, or slow down, or help out, or even manage the process of destabilization. And in this case, there's these two authors that they make the uh, distinction among do, do, uh, two different types of uh, untended governance. One is the institutional drift, which basically is the lack of adopting uh, measures. It is what was also talked in the case of the trainway when we are not making an active role to try to reproduce the system. And the other one is basically when you don't um, anticipate or you're failing to anticipate external pressures, that is the institutional exhaustion. So what we found interesting of the point that we want to observe in this case is that Professor Turnham in the chapter he calls that these uh, often can be presented in the, in the framework of the topic as some sort of inaction but is uh, a particular form of intervention that he calls neglectful or self-consuming governance. And what we want to bring out is that in the case of trainways, a uh, thing that we can enhance is the fact that actors engaged with trainway construction and operations did indeed not offer a significant resistance to the various pressures that they were experimenting from external, con <laughs> from external uh, sources. But referring to the formula that we saw in the conclusion and also in another part of the presentation, we have that destabilization is the result of a change in pressure, a change in responses, and also a change in the commitments. And uh, no, <laughs> oh, in the case of the trainways, we saw and it was presented that indeed there was a lack of responses and weakened commitments. And we can relate this to the notion of inaction or some sort of neglectful in the case of governance. But what we would like to uh, like bring to the discussion in this case is how are we perceiving the notion of a neglectful or a self-consuming governance. And in this case, like we would like to enhance the aspect that is softer criticized that in the multi-level perspective or even in the socio-technical system uh, framework, one main uh, critic that arises is that they are not very focalized into the social aspect, that they focus more into the technical aspect of it. So sometimes among defining the different uh, categories, it can appear that they are overlooking some aspects. We would like to point out that we are not saying that these elements are completely absent in the discussions because they are definitely touch into the chapter in another development in the topic, but we would like to say that they have a, like a different perspective due to this uh, lack of focusing into the more social dynamics. Particularly in coming from uh, this framework, we can point out two key elements that will be um, important to enhance, and is the power relations and the pre-existing conditions. With power relations, we are going to refer particularly to conflicts and 
this was different maybe. Well, incumbent actors, and then we're going to see also in pre-existing conditions the homogeneous perspective. Regarding to power relations, and we are going to mainly address conflicts, and there's also the role of incumbent actors, but Sarah already went a little bit more over that. We would like to take out like two critical perspectives and coming from this focus on more social dynamics is often criticized that while addressing transitions and also the MLP in general, we don't perceive that the aspect of the dynamics of the capitalist system is sufficiently addressed. And into these dynamics and might be also a theoretical choice that the authors do for addressing these topics. Uh, the aspect of power relations is not particularly presented as a conflict. And uh, among the critics that have arised, Gills gives a response to these critics and he says that in fact, currently there has been more work to try to implement these topics of power relations or power dynamics because in fact when you are trying to approach governance or policy making, you encounter that there's like these shifts and changes into the balance of power but it is, it is not addressed as a conflict and this can overlook the tumultuous natures of the system. Also coming from a critical or different perspective, we have that Gramscian political ecology says that it's important to uh, focus or to analyze the role that the actors and the struggle of the actors is playing in challenging the hegemonic order. And another relevant element in this case is the pre-existing conditions. And while we address pre-existing conditions, we would like to point out what we call the homogeneous perspective and that also Aaron is going to explain a little bit more. And that is the fact that according to some authors and particularly Feola and Kenis, we found that transitions approaches are lacking into implementing certain characteristics into the way that they perceive reality. And this is mainly because they are perceiving uh, or they are coming from a framework of the global north. In this sense, the government or the governance actions are portrayed as just uh, relevant regarding the characteristic of the global north. And this is an overlook, particularly when addressing uh, countries or developing countries, uh, particularly from the global south. Uh, and in this case, what we can say regarding the first question that was portrayed is how do we perceive the notion of neglectful and self-consuming governments? An aspect that we would like to say is that in some cases the neglectful notion or the neglectful position is nothing more than a lack of both the knowledge and the resources regarding system destabilization. And this is particularly relevant when we are addressing topics like the sustainable transition. For example, if we are saying that destabilization is a key a tool or a key element that we can use to achieve a sustainable transition. The lack of knowledge in certain cases, and while we address this homogeneous position, can be particularly important, especially for countries in the Global South. And in this case, coming from the contributions of a more critical perspective, contextualizing and historicizing the transitions will be a key element, especially when we are trying to address what is the uh, right way to government these transitions. Or even if we can make the question, is the destabilization is possible to government in all of the cases, or if there really is like a neglectful position. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about wider considerations, um, mainly, uh, kind of taking it global. It is economic policy for the global transition. So it's in the syllabus, I'm just doing my job. Um, and uh, this is considered in the book with wider political and economic relations and how these can have negative consequences, but it's mainly presented only as the outcomes of transitions. So it's framed in loss of jobs and um, the negative impacts or unequal impacts on vulnerable groups but not as so much in the process or kind of the, the activities and actions of um, these entities. And international global dynamics are still given as a uh, landscape, um, exogenous, and uh, we wanna look into a little bit more into 
how whether these acting do do landscapes actually also include acting entities that are in the field and interacting with actors in the system. Um, and uh, Fim Schilling, a co-author of yours, uh, and Bintz um, expanded on this with global socio-technical regimes. Um, they underscore that there is methodological nationalism in transition studies, which was kind of clear with the previous presentation on tramways in France, wine in Austria, um, coal in UK, um, and more often than not, there's actual global rationalities and obvious global relations that are influencing but also carrying out actions on how these transitions are shaping and play a central role. Um, they identify that there are power asymmetries, of course, in global value chains and uh, global production networks that exert influence and shape regimes, which often sideline then local or system internal endogenous uh, socio-technical configurations for something from abroad. Um, so the question is, which actors are most powerful in maintaining or, cha or changing institutional rationalities and how does the social structure shape these processes? Is the focal point really an incumbent system endogenous actors? And they present the case of the Chinese wastewater sector, um, where in the 1970s China had big issues. They were, they were very much in a transitory state in the middle of their economic opening. Um, and they had very strong issues with their wastewater infrastructure that they needed to fix. Um, they were starting to open up to the global world and having more visitors and, and business, and it was a big issue in the cities. Um, and there were actually some local uh, experimental solutions to this that were focused on uh, water sustainability or environmental sustainability, but unfortunately the Chinese government was swayed by um, uh, foreign expertise into a different approach that was more focused on cost efficiency instead of environmental sustainability um, because of the legitimacy of global actors over their internal local actors that had already been began experimenting um, to solve this issue. Um, the global influence and power asymmetries are obviously diffused through um, international actors like multinational corporations that were uh, carrying out these expertise through consulting, uh, but also development banks that were giving out loans conditional on uh, the way that these were carried out. Um, th these changes were in infrastructure were carried out. Um, and they ended up in a lock-in with an approach that was not fitting for China's um, situation and circumstances of scarcity um, and instead was centralized and cost efficient. So you have the neoliberal rationality that, um, yeah, powered through. Uh, one minute, okay. Um, yeah, there are other colonial rationalities that are really interesting. We already mentioned Feola um, and that's another criticism of socio-technical uh, research that it's very Global North focused and kind of identifies Global South maybe kind of uh, not explicitly, but as dysfunctional and doesn't really analyze or aim to adapt transitions to the co context in the global south. Um, we also have ecological considerations and unequal exchange in the world. Um, that's a really good paper if you want to look into it. And global capitalist opportunism. How will countries carry out um, or manage destabilization and then carry out phase outs when you're essentially putting yourself in a vulnerable state um, where countries from the global north that can take advantage of these opportunities, kind of like in the case of China, um, can come in and kind of view, are you asking for trouble by, by carrying out this destabilization purposefully? Next slide. Um, on the critical analysis of capitalism and neoliberalism, in your book in 2022, it criticizes um, kind of questioning um, it questions the research that sees capitalism and the uh, that sees the issues that, ha that have come from a regime of capitalism um, in transitions, and it criticizes it for being reductionist because it oversimplifies complex realities back to single root causes, so capitalist uh, socioeconomic structures. Um, and it disempowers it at the same time because you can just say capitalism is everywhere and it's too big of a problem. At the same time, um, 
the it dismisses this entirely in favor of socio-technical systems reconfiguring instead of overthrowing capitalism or questioning the capitalist uh, yeah the capitalist circumstances that we work in um, and I I see it a bit as kind of questioning whether the logic that somebody has is valid just because the solutions that they're proposing off of it are questionable so if you say yes, capitalism is not great, let's overthrow it, let's do degrowth entirely, let's all go live on farms. Um, that doesn't mean to say if you disagree with going to live on farms that capitalism is perfect and it shouldn't be questioned. Um, and that was kind of the way that it was dismissed in these uh, questionings of um, whether we have a bigger problem than just the way that transitions are carried out, um, which can fall into an epistemic fallacy of if it's too complex and we can't model it, should we just disregard it? And these are our discussion questions. You have the floor. Yeah. <laughs> Shortly, so that we can also take a few questions from the, the audience. OK. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, it's extremely dense and challenging. Uh, I want to first really, I mean, congratulate the... If I had such good students, I would teach more. Um, or maybe it should be the other way around. No, but seriously, I want to really congratulate the, the quality of the response. It's not the first time that I intervene in this class, and, and I, I have to really say that it's... Uh, this promotion, yes, that it's uh, exceptional circumstances in France. Uh, I, I don't know another setting. I'm really emotional about this, uh, David. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's it's really exceptional, and you should uh, be proud of yourself, and uh, and also feel uh, uh, privileged. Uh, I think what you've done in 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 just a few minutes was well beyond what I could do in in one hour. So <laughs> I'm, I'm also uh, humbled by this. I want to congratulate also your sort of uh, deep curiosity and not just sticking to the two texts or the uh, 20 slides that I offered, but really going deep. And, you know, I mean, if I could have students like this every day, I would, yeah, uh, I mean, come and do a PhD with me anytime. <laughs> uh, um, no, but seriously, I mean, this is okay. Uh, I, uh, so first, I'll go one by one very, very quickly. So first you found Sterling. I'm very pleased you did. Andy Sterling was my PhD co-supervisor. Uh, I think he's, uh, you know, Frank Hills was my PhD supervisor. He's one of the most cited uh, uh, social scientists of all time. Uh, uh, Andy Sterling is probably one of the most brilliant living minds, I think. And it's, it's wonderful that you took the time to read uh, the very difficult texts that he produces. And I think you made, you know, uh, a, a sound uh, analysis of, of his uh, points in this worm's eye view uh, paper on incumbency and just read everything he's ever written. It's not that much. It's very dense, but there's not that much uh, written. And, and I mean, I'm very happy that you found this. Uh, trams, uh, I was uh, summarizing the trams case as a self-fulfilling prophecy found, I found quite reductionist uh, because the whole point, and but I'm sure you did see this, is that it's all about process and it's all about dynamics of change, conditions of change, but also changing conditions uh, in which uh, uh, these uh, systems evolve. So this self-fulfilling prophecy, eventually it became, but it was not initially so. And so if we put ourselves now in an action setting, you know, if we want to see the socially just, politically, democratic uh, transformations happen, how, I mean, one question we can ask ourselves, what, how do we contribute to creating these conditions for a self-fulfilling prophecy to, to become more uh, likely? I like that you even went to read stuff about trams in France and Pasalacqua. I disagree with some of his points, but, uh, but he's got uh, 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 significant uh, things to say, and I, I, I didn't even cover it. In the, but indeed, the aesthetic motivation is, is an important uh, point, uh, and it's probably a, 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 an explanation I don't use enough uh, to, to explain maybe why there was some hesitance in 
pushing the full technical potential of this uh, um, uh, electric tram. Basically, there were aesthetic concerns that these overhead lines were disturbing the wonderful, beautiful Paris that uh, they had. And so the societies and associations of architects and urbanists and, and, uh, uh, and whatnot sort of uh, uh, got involved in that. But that also drove innovation because it allowed you know, the development of uh, underground uh, attraction. That, that, that was a significant uh, issue. Power, 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 power. Yes, I think transitions, I mean, I started with this, and perhaps uh, you know, when you prepared the work, you didn't necessarily uh, see that, uh, because I only gave you little uh, uh, crumbs of uh, slides to, to, to work from. Uh, but of course, I mean, I think transitions are I wouldn't say this 20 years ago, and I think no one would necessarily, well, some voices did, but today it's become blatantly clear that transitions are you know, fundamentally about power and power relations and what is, and the worldviews and the ethics that come with that and accepting that it will be power dynamics, it will be struggles, it will be struggles, maybe there are ways for negotiating between worldviews, assembling different worldview, plural worlds maybe, but neglecting that fundamentally and eventually it becomes power, power struggles. I think you're right. I mean, it's become central and there's not enough work on that. Again, you pointed Sterling, you s uh, Flor Avellino has a ERC on, on power in transitions, which is amazing. She sort of Remobilizing all the political science on power and all the different, and it's just started now. She's got open, you know, PhD positions that will be opening in uh, uh, Rotterdam very soon. And you should, you know, if someone's interested, Giuseppe Feola as well in in uh, in uh, where is he in Utrecht uh, has a very interesting ERC program on power. And you know, this this is just it's just such a fruitful uh, issue. Capitalism, okay. How do we deal with this? I mean, it's, again, you've done your homework very well. You've read all the criticism on transitions studies, the very valid criticism on transition studies that is, has historically largely become developed from a Western perspective, mobilizing Western uh, global North historical cases to make its paradigmatic examples and to derive the theory from that. And then a lot of it has become just, you know, to, to, uh, to hammer everything's a, a nail kind of uh, situation. And that shouldn't be, and we should, and that's why I also insisted in the very beginning, take a critical look. And I really like that you picked this up also uh, 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 independently. Um, there is, so beyond Giuseppe Fola, uh, Flo Avellino, there is now combining issues of capitalism, Marxism, and Global South, the work of Mark Swilling in Stellenbosch University in, in South Africa. Again, he's got loads of PhD positions opening, and you know he's looking at uh, issues of power, is issues of justice. Uh, he was a very strong, even practitioner himself of the anti-apartheid movement. He's got a number of friends who got killed. He's you know, and he's advancing agenda on just transitions, peaceful transitions uh, in global South context, so mostly South Africa and, and neighboring countries. He's largely uh, focusing on energy, but also beyond, and really, that's, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing agenda he's developing. Uh, so read more, he's got open access books on, on just transitions. Uh, deep transitions you did not pick up on. Okay, so there's a little strand, new strand of literature that specifically looks at deeper structural uh, uh, logics uh, in society, uh, whether this is you know, big stuff like modernity, colonialism, uh, uh, capitalism, uh, and they're advocating, I mean, I don't really, I like the idea, I like the research formulation, I don't necessarily like how they're, where they're bringing it, so that's uh, uh, Johann Schott, for instance, uh, deep transitions, uh, but it's a very fruitful area. Uh, of course, in this context, what I've presented, what you've picked up, we're looking at functional systems. The boundaries are analytical, but they're developed around, you know, 
mobility, energy, blah, blah, and we don't question necessarily the really fundamental underlying rule, modernity, capital, uh, and it has to be done, uh, okay? I, uh, and this can't be done alone with these kinds of theoretical frameworks. It's combinations of them, uh, but some are doing, you know? Giuseppe Feola, Max Willing, Flora Avellino are combining uh, Marxist theories or Foucauldian perspectives on power to sort of put the transition frameworks on their heads. Uh, voila. Conflict, I won't have time to uh, address this. The neglectful, yeah, I think it's interesting that, you know, you point out that, that I don't uh, 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 pick up that neglectful governance can be, you know, the consequence of just simply lack of knowledge. But my argument was that this argument is like, in most cases, it's not just simply lack of knowledge. And that's also what I pick up from Strake and Talen. Uh, uh, no, in most cases, inaction, sorry we didn't know, sorry we didn't do, is an active thing. It is an action. Inaction is an action. You know, uh, Macron telling us that he did not anticipate the gilet jaune, that he did not anticipate the farmer resistance against, uh, you know, stronger regulations. I don't buy this. He decided to make that transition not to foreground the political element, or actually maybe he anticipated to make it a political struggle that he will never win and had to, sorry, I can't do anything, that, you know, these people have claims. And so that's not good transitions policy. That's not good transitions governance. Uh, uh, but inaction is a kind of action. You know, it's it's. Well, uh, I'll keep it to that. I think to to uh, open. The floor. And so we will take. Well, thanks a, a lot. Just one or two sets of questions, quite short. Okay, Re hands. Okay. Um, hi, Professor. Thank you for the lecture. I'm Beatriz from Brazil. Um, and my question, I guess, is goes a little bit in the direction of you mentioned briefly during the presentation that transitions uh, ideally wouldn't produce new forms of inequality, but I guess uh, that it's kind of like difficult to get <laughs> not new inequalities or like uh, new contradictions that emerge from a certain uh, new formation. So my question is, uh, during the historical cases that you studied, is there any uh, I guess any um, any form of identifying these sort of new contradictions that can emerge, or a strategy that can, uh, well, make it easier, I guess, to try to prevent this sort of like new formations, I guess, inequalities or contradictions from. Two or three questions. Mm -hmm. so that's you. Okay, uh, there, behind you. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Thomas from Norway. Uh, I have a question about. Uh, fossil fuels mm -hmm. and uh, how we can create the circumstances to to allow, uh, to de create this destabilization in, in the fossil fuel uh, system and allow for a phase out eventually because basically yeah no I, I yeah, as I mentioned I'm from Norway which where there's a really strong oil lobby and it feels um, and there are calls from the civil side for instance to phase out oil but it seems like the condition conditions are not there Mm -hmm. And um, so basically my question is, do you think there is, is there any point in trying to take action from in a supplier country uh, or d do you have to do something on the demand side uh, for, for a fa phase out to happen? Like, is there any point in demanding a phase out in, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, for s fossil fuel suppli suppliers? Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. Super interesting. Uh, Friederike from Germany. Um, my question goes into a similar direction, but more specific to finance and a credit. So as like a like presupposition for investment. And I'm wondering if there's uh, uh, how this is treated in this literature that basically also different forms of finance, different expansions of investment, <coughs> credit creation, how does this coincide with transitions in, in, in this kind of literature? Is there some sort of like credit contraction taken into account when we look at uh, this destabilization process? So basically, like finance and money is like a bit of a thing that touches all those different aspects that you discussed in the beginning that are like the object of this research. Um, I wonder if there's any literature on this or, mm -hmm. yeah. Thomas, if 
guys if you ask me a question already. <laughs> okay. Um, I had, I'm Antoine from France. I have a question about um, do we take care about the, um, the things that is left from a, a, a phase out or, or a social, social um, uh, technical system that, uh, that is not there anymore? So, um, because like some people talk about the negative comments that is left uh, from uh, on many things about uh, uh, like, uh, for example, the tramway system. Um, do who take care about uh, dismantling the railroads? Uh, is that something that is left to the public sector? Is that, is that the companies that built uh, those railroads? Uh, but uh, also other uh, topics like uh, uh, I don't know, like the coal uh, uh, plants, or uh, so. Yeah, is is that something also that is um, on the research agenda? Uh, is that something that is uh, far from the research agenda? And, and is it also a, a gatekeeper uh, for uh, those transitions that uh, you're talking about? Okay, I'll give you a few minutes and then we take the last one. Please. Okay. Um, maybe I'll start with the last one. Uh, so I think you're alluding to the work by Alexandre Monin and uh, uh, Diego Landivar on, on ruins. Uh, they distinguish uh, two forms of ruins that modernity will might leave uh, uh, behind us. So ruined ruins, ruina uh, ruinata, just stuff left behind, and ruin, uh, uh, ruinans, so uh, ruins that are contributing, still contributing to damage. So you can think, for instance, of uh, you know uh, nuclear waste as a uh, um, you know, a, a, a ruin or con the, the, the continued pollution of soil. Very different from, you know, just a, 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 a building that is still standing. Um, well, so I'm directly discussing with uh, Alexandre Monin. I'm actually inviting him at a, at a, in a conference in, in, in a month's time. We discuss a lot. Uh, he has a program that is specifically oriented towards uh, disconnection. And he's got a much more, he's a philosopher, but also a, someone who works in, a, in the setting of a business school. His idea is that we, and I pretty much uh, agree with him, not on the political motive, but on the, on the strategy, is that we, it, it concurs with my, my analogy of the egg. You know, we need to learn to do this stuff. We need to learn to take care of dying stuff, you know. Uh, and there is knowledge, there are practices that deal with this. Museums do that, have done this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Conservationists in museums, they're handling stuff that is fragile and potentially dying. We might want to look at our industrial heritage, look after it as well, in a way, decide what is to be conserved, what is not to be conserved. Similar decisions that a curator at an archaeological museum has to make on a regular basis because their uh, collections and archives are not uh, unlimited. There are more and more connections that are forming uh, there. On the finance, I really, it's beyond my knowledge. I know that there is uh, uh, a lot of research on financing transitions, uh, uh, the role of finance in transitions, uh, and that connects so beyond the socio-technical approach to transition to socio-economic uh, uh, frameworks um, and socio-institutional that look at how do you change the rules of the game in a, such a very specialized uh, industry. So I'm not very I'm not knowledgeable enough, uh, but here again I think it's interesting to take a pathways approach to understand that. You know, there's a spectrum of kinds of intervention, more, more or less systemic, uh, that go all the way from, you know, greening, whether it's a, you know, a, 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 a discursive or a real greening, all the way to complete structural overhaul of, of, uh, of economic uh, systems and, and what uh, values we finance or not uh, fin finance. Uh, for fossil fuels in Norway and uh, supplier countries, um, 
I mean, it's a huge part of the problem. I mean, as long as we have uh, oil-rich or fossil-rich uh, countries that have, uh, a, you know, the major part of their economy dependent on this vested interest in a, uh, 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 resource stocks and their exploitation, how do we handle this? So, I mean, w there are many ways to look at that. One of them would be a sort of political economy angle, you know, isolating these countries, for instance, geopolitically. Another would be perhaps more uh, a positive way is, is uh, supporting a diversification of uh, economies so that this dependence on uh, this sort of mono dependence on, on a one single industry is less. I think that's the case already structurally of the Nor Norwegian economy and that maybe less so in some of the uh, Arabic uh, Peninsula uh, countries. So, well, uh, that's not helping much, but I mean, these are some hints. And in terms of, uh, you know, how do we anticipate and deal with uh, unintended new forms of inequality and vulnerability that come from transitions? I mean, the first point is to accept that there is no win-win. It doesn't exist. This is sort of a, a myth of the 90s win-win situations, you know, we're going to make everyone happy. Transitions are brutal. Transitions are, you know, create or reproduce, create new injustices or reproduce existing forms of injustice. The real question is how do you anticipate this and uh, minimize it uh, as, as best uh, you can? Um, Yeah, and there are many different sort of policy strategies that are being developed uh, from compensation to, to all sorts of other. But uh, yeah, it's about, about strategic intelligence. First, having the kinds of knowledge to know what these, in ten, uh, these uh, negative impacts may be, then taking them into account and, uh, and, and mobilizing them uh, actively and seeking to address them. I mean, I think the... the the car manufacturing and the program of electrification <coughs> has known the whole time that it will intensify pressure on mining and that this will mostly be located in uh, some African countries, Chile and Argentina, and that this will lead to protest, expropriation, etc. So, you know, anticipation and bringing these parties to the table at least would be a minimum. Hi, Professor. I'm Nikhil Rampal. I'm from India. I have two questions for you. Very simple. So the first one is on the coal, phasing out of coal. So India, uh, as you know, 77% of India's energy requirements are filled by coal. Now, according to your destabilization equations, uh, there is changes, pressure, and commitments. The problem with India is that all the coal mines are owned by the government. 90% of the power distribution companies are owned by the government and the public uh, seldom protests about their energy coming from coal because the government says that we are trying to eradicate poverty by adding more and more coal into the system. So so where does destabilization come into this picture when nobody is protesting and the government is also happy by burning coal? And second question is, I come from a city which was designed by Le Corbusier. If you know, he made 50 perfect rectangles and one of those rectangles I live in. So um, if you look at the charts that you presented for tramways, there is a little surge after the 90s or now, like the, 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 the graphic of the trams is going up. So should we conclude that cities which were badly designed or cities which had no room for, say, underground tunnels or flyovers or flyways are resorting back to trams? Like if you look at Florence uh, in Italy, it has no metro, but it only has trams. Mm -hmm. Do you think that cities which are poor in, in, in developing countries, which find it very hard to invest in metro, can use tramways as an alternative between those diesel-run buses mm -hmm. and those costly metro uh, expansions? Mm -hmm. Okay, quicker question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Zara from Germany. Um, to complete all this talk about different sources of energy, I would love to come back to nuclear power. Mm -hmm. You unfortunately skipped over that in the presentation. Um, coming from Germany, we have a very peculiar culture around nuclear energy, and I was just 
wondering what you make of the German nuclear phase out, uh, seeing that, I don't know, from my naive understanding, the technological conditions are very similar, for instance, between Germany and France. There have been the same sort of external shocks like Fukushima, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, why are the trajectories so different with Germany phasing out and France doubling down on nuclear energy? Hmm? Uh, I'm Enzo, I'm from Brazil. Uh, you talked a lot about transitions and I wanted to understand uh, the interaction between uh, the digital transition within in, in other uh, transitions uh, in the sense of uh, if it's uh, intensifying the impacts of actors, deci actors' decision making or in the man maintenance or reduction of commitment when it comes to other social technical regimes. Okay, up to you, you have uh, another oh. question. No? We have many, uh, the problem is that we have another seminar after. Ah, also. Really? Okay. Maybe during the, the break you can ask any questions. So you just have the call in India, the nuclear in Germany, so you have two minutes, it's fine. Amazing, <laughs> perfect. Okay, so it wasn't just a, an error of sampling that I got the good students, I got that they're everywhere. Okay, <laughs> this is you know even further positive. Uh, coal, okay, India, coal. Um, where is destabilization? I mean, what you're describing in India is a situation where there is a th no uh, national level uh, destabilization of coal. You know, the commitments is strong. There are actually very strong ties and incentives to maintain things as they are. Uh, the strategies are stick together and maintain the commitment to public ownership, and hence, I would imagine and expect defending the social value of this access to uh, cheap energy that this uh, generates. Uh, uh, certainly there are pressures, but are they visible enough? And this is, you know, where it's not meant as an equation, huh? it's more <laughs> as a formulation. Pressure fronts significant enough to constitute challenges to the context. Perhaps the pressures are not significant, whether they're international uh, um, uh, conventions or whether certainly there is somehow, somewhere, a social mobilization against coal mining, but perhaps that is silenced or not uh, uh, significant enough. Well, I'll, I won't dwell further because I don't know much about uh, the case, uh, uh, but you can go see my colleague D Dinesh Abrol, who's uh, very active in, in uh, the politics of uh, anything transitions in India, uh, uh, heavy lobbying the government against uh, their what he sees as their uh, 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 non-progressive measures. Uh, the pickup of trams. So I've written well before this a paper on the diffusion of modern trams in France. I uh, did not want to talk about it today because I didn't want to confuse you, and the confusion is is regularly done that this is just a renewal of. Of, of the old tram. And, and this is also an argument that uh, Pasalacqua is, is suggesting, and I completely disagree with him, that you know, history somehow repeats itself or is stuttering in his word, Histoire Begay. Uh, uh, when, uh, in my view, and you have a look at the paper, Diffusions of, of Modern Trams in, in France, uh, it's a complete new invention. Of course, they pick up parts that are, ex and that's very handy, you know, there's a vision. But the, the vision of the tram then was very negative. So just to illustrate, when they made an open call for the design of new standard tram systems in the 70s, uh, the call to uh, 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 suppliers was, had all the words but never mentioned the trams. It was public transportation, rolling to public transportation, electrified on rail. Ah, okay, so they did everything they could to sort of not... Anyway, uh, uh, one strategy that you'll find in that paper really interesting uh, is in Strasbourg in the 90s, when the mayor got the money to make a metro, she decided to take that funding, public funding, turn it into financing a tram system, which obviously is much cheaper, about a third of a metro, and as well, pedestrianization of the whole uh, city center. So she did a uh, joint urban planning and tra transport, so that's a, a German nuclear comparison. Yeah, what I would have said is that uh, uh, on the surface, if I had looked, 
you know, specifically if we focus on Fukushima, major crisis, international, and should have revoked any sort of feeling or attachments to nuclear energy as something that would have a future, uh, should have, you know, uh, led to very, uh, was actually did not have such a major effect. What happened in Germany is that Fukushima, and with the coincidence of uh, uh, government change, uh, reinforced an existing plan to phase out. Okay? In France, it reinforced a new turn in transparency about the managed security risks of nuclear installations in France, and hence further investment. Uh, and now we're in a completely new chapter for two years for, with, the, uh, with the nuclear renaissance. I would really encourage you, if you're interested in this, to look at uh, the Austrian case. Austria, a case that developed nuclear capacities, actually purchased and installed a, uh, a power plant and never opened it because it coincided with a with a, a, a political protest and actually a configurational moment and that goes back to deep transition in the imaginary of how do we govern in that particular national setting technology. And so Ulrike Feld uh, uh, writes about this. She talks about a national imaginary that was developed then in Austria about keeping technologies out. It's very different from destabilization. It's actually not starting something, but it's really related to precaution and extremely interesting. And it links to the question of vulnerability. You know, Austria did around nuclear in the 70s develop a capacity to have a sort of national consensus that you know we Austrians are able to say no. And then they remobilized the same imaginary to say no to GMO and then to say no to certain applications of nano development. So this is really, really interesting. This is how many multiple forms of transition government can sort of uh, uh, seep deeper into the rationalities of, of governing. Digital and, wow, it's a big question to deal in 20 seconds. Digital and other transitions. I'm no expert. Uh, uh, I would like someone to explain to me what is a digital transition. Uh, you know, I mean, clearly there's a process of digitalization and some are referring to, you know, technical revolution and this would be, you know, the fourth or fifth surge, it's the digitalization. But I mean, when did this start? Is that a 2010 sort of thing? I don't think so. I think it starts in the 50s, you know, start maybe before with the Enigma machine, whatever, with cybernetics. Uh, and we are perhaps in a moment of significant acceleration of this. but. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure I can qualify it in, in terms of transition. I think they're technological revolutions. So the idea that we, there are uh, regularly in uh, the same way as the, you know, the revolution around coal and steam, there are global purpose technologies that eventually sort of lock and enable new you know, connection with new kinds of infrastructure, new kinds of economic organization and, uh, and actors, as well as new techniques. I think it's a bit deeper than the transitions I've been talking about. Uh, well, keep it to that. <laughs>